A lot is written and said about women empowerment today. Today's women don't live in shadows. We are CEOs, we're doctors, engineers. Uh, we can do anything we want. The glass ceiling has truly been shattered. But despite all of these achievements, are we really represented evenly in the workplace? Labor participation rates show that we're still a far way from this. Government data, in fact, shows the labor force participation rate for women rising to 25% recently. It was abysmally low at 19% the year before that. And this is driven largely by women in rural areas. But India's overall space for women, working women, is very, very abysmal. Compare it with other countries. China at 62%, Vietnam at 70%, and the European Union at 51%. So why are we still holding back? It's not as if women cannot go out in the workplace. Are they choosing not to? Is the workplace today not as inviting as it should be, could be? Where is the hitch? To speak on this, I'm joined today by Rituparna Chakravarti, co-founder and executive director at Team Lease Services, Karuna Nandi, advocate Supreme Court of India, Vishaka RM, MD and CEO at India First Life Insurance, and Amisha Vora, chairperson and MD at Prabuddhas Leeladhar. Now, we've invited women who are leaders in their own respective fields to try and get a perspective of why this is an issue across sectors, where there are, of course, women who are making the headlines, who are at the top. But how many women are there actually in those fields? Let me begin, Rituparna, with your perspective on this. And I want to go beyond the data today because there are various data slices of what the female uh, participation in our labor force is. There's a World Bank number, there's a CMI number, there's the government's number. But everyone agrees we need to increase this number. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, given that you started off saying, let's look beyond data, all the data that I came prepared with, like, I'll just keep it aside. Uh, the fact that is worrying is that um, I think uh, why we're probably trying to declare victory because we saw some needle movement in the women labor workforce participation, the recent data that came out. However, that's really very, very, still very, very low. Uh, what, of course, remains a worry is that uh, urban employment, uh, just as in a women participation in urban India, definitely is not taking off. Uh, and in incidentally, we were kind of digging deep as to why this is happening, given that clearly there has been an improvement in women education, by the way, in urban India. So why is it that more and more women, while they're getting more educated, why are they not coming into the workforce or they're, or they're dropping out of the workforce? Uh, the concerns are many. I mean, people are saying that a lot of the education or the intent behind education, Tamana, is to find a better match. Essentially, the better your education, the better match you get. Uh, then, of course, there are issues of apprehensions around uh, safety, for example, at workplace apprehension around commute time, apprehension in terms of being able to, uh, once you become a working mother, whether you will be able to manage your home, your uh, children, given that India is, doesn't have the kind of ecosystem or the work to be able to um, have, to be able to help children grow up if you're working uh, in, in from an office. So I think some of this, and I'm, the reasons are many more, are coming in the way right now. And uh, um, I think the, the answer to it, probably, I don't know whether it's premature to jump to it, but like I keep saying that at the moment our focus, there are many issues in front of women, but at the moment our focus should be do every, everything which actually encourages women to come to the formal workforce and avoid anything which becomes a detriment for women to uh, be in the workforce. So anything which becomes that, that, that instigation or anything that becomes essentially an, an, a, an aspect which can allow some employers to not hire women, we'll have to stay clear of them. For example, the Maternity Benefit Act. I think people thought that it was done with good intent, but it ended up actually having uh, a reverse impact on women and women at workforce. So I, I actually, we should tread with caution in terms of what is practical and what is activism? So, you know, we need to understand, uh, I think to take that point forward, Rituparna, we need to understand 
why the labor participation rates are low and especially in urban areas where by some estimates as low as 18 percent this is when it's expected relatively that these women have a greater access to education less sort of cultural taboos of working outside the house etc um, are they not getting the jobs or are they choosing not to work and that's, the that's data, yeah the data suggests them or not that uh, surprisingly so and unfortunately so a large number of women are choosing actually not hmm. they're opting out they're preferring to play the role of uh the hope homemaker and of course i mean the fact that there are there is some amount of growing affluence in the urban areas i think uh, the, the job level, the salary levels for even if there is one person in the family or the, or the, the man in the house, if he's earning, is growing up. And some of those considerations are coming into play, saying that the women probably should stay back home and manage the, the house, the children, and so on and so forth. And like I said, some of the other apprehensions around safety, uh, commute time, trans why will you waste time moving from one place to the another? Sometimes you are traveling with your husband. Your husband has a tra uh, transferable job and hence your career pretty much gets hinged around what your yeah. husband is doing. So there are plenty of reasons, Tamanna, right now. You know, those reasons have been there traditionally for several years. What's shocking is that we seem to be regressing backwards. Our uh, rates of participation in the labor force for women were higher in 2005 than today. Some of it could be the pandemic effect. I want to come to Vishakha, uh, our M, for this. Um, again, is it women choosing to opt out because culturally the outlook still is that if you can afford to, why not sit at home? Versus you have an education, you have an ability, and you have a right to find your place in this world. Yeah, thank you so much, Tamina. It's you know, I probably, um, I'm going to step back at the start of my career. I've been working for over 35 years. I started my career in 87, okay? And I, at that time, the most happening jobs were public sector jobs, bank jobs. And I dare say, after having worked about 13 years in the public sector, moved to the private sector. And I still remember the relief that, great, my kids are seven and five when I moved to the private sector. I have to admit that the public sector policies are far more equitable when it concerns workplace ethics. Uh, the private sector is so caught up in productivity. It's so caught, caught up in the capitalist you know, economy uh, where they look at the here and now productivity and they don't look at the long term. They don't look at the fact that a woman may take one extra day off, but then when she comes back in, she makes sure that she delivers the most sincerest work that you can ever get. Yeah. Um, I think the the value that women bring in from an emotional quotient, from from uh, putting their heart into it, is something that is not really translated monetarily and the capitalist economy does not recognize it. Um, I know that I have to make extra efforts to call out biases of managers in our organization to say, are you looking at face time or are you looking at results and productivity? Are you looking and judging a woman on the basis of how many hours she spent versus your male colleagues who, can, who are staying late? Or are you going to look at the end of the day on productivity? You know, these are questions that we need to really ask. I don't think, yes, definitely from a background perspective, when we joined, it was a background of scarcity. Probably we needed to work much more than, you know, our children who are coming from a background of plenty. Having said which, women are also becoming more ambitious and they're having to be put down. You know, we also have, if you have a background of plenty, you also have access to more support. You also have access to drivers and maids and so on in, in urban areas. Right. So it's not social at all. I think it's a lot to do with the capitalist economy that realizing more from a resource for the short term, not willing to invest for the long term from both sides, right? The, the loyalty that a public sector employee gives to the organization is reciprocated, but in the private sector, they're both not reciprocating it. I think it's got to do with a lot of culture. 
and not necessarily about society you know uh, vishakha ji i want to thank you for bringing in your own perspective and for the fact i want to applaud the fact that you talk about how you have to rein in those biases in your workplace and as a woman who is in the position to do that in your organization i'm glad you're doing that i'm glad you know reaching out now women are taking on different roles in the workplace some of them are leading companies working in companies their employees uh, some of them are using their own skill sets karuna nandi let me come to you on this we're going to have uh, the first woman chief justice of india in some time it's landmark it's going to be a landmark uh, but is there fair and equitable representation of women in the whole judiciary and in the legal system among lawyers among advocates as well the top names are still very heavily dominated by men isn't it that's absolutely right and one of the things that the current chief justice has tried to do is to uh, reach out Uh, you know is to appoint more women judges and uh, also the previous chief justice uh, justice lalit and they've achieved some incremental um victories what we need though i think and i was never a believer previously in women's reservation and as i see you know as time goes on it becomes crystal clear to me that the experiences of other countries and also most prominently the experience of our country means that in parliament we must have reservation otherwise the kinds of laws that are being passed and not passed are not informed by the experiences of women i was heavily involved in the criminal law amendment bill of 2013 that were called the anti rape laws at the time and when the law on stalking was tabled uh sharad yadav at the time said ye to hum to roz picha karte the ladkiyon ka isko to non available nahi hona chahiye today we find that when a woman is being followed repeatedly um and she then finally goes to the police station that aspect means that the magistrate's hands are tied that she can't do anything and she says find me she says counsel find me some law from somewhere and so we use where is applicable the it act section 67a but why should this be required in the law with regard to the judiciary i think that at the very least i'm not advocating for reservation necessarily but what i am saying is that if we have an aspirational quota if we say that at least 50% of the uh, makeup of judges should be women then I, th- those are actually proven to work so if we have targets then that active and aggressive outreach to people to women who may not put up their hands but who may be highly competent you know there are lots of studies that are done that say you know a man may be say 55% ready and he'll say you know i'm i'm there for the job and a woman may be 75% ready and she say nahi karun what about lawyers what about lawyers Uh, i mean there it's 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 a service right if you're good your yeah. uh, success rates are good you will have more clients coming to you i i presume so over there well, is it is it a level playing field or it's a or, lot more complicated than that it's a lot more complicated than that so <laughs> if you have say pali nari we've got a fantastic lawyer and your case is really bad right so one big variable is the are the merits of your case so you may have you know mr nariman arguing for you but if your merits are this good at best he'll make it this good right now if the winning level is here you're fine if the winning level is here you're not right secondly in terms of building a practice there in terms of being successful and having clients there's an aspect of the law which is running a small business let me not make two bones about it you know the practice of law is a very intellectual strategic interesting exercise and that's the thing that that gets tv shows etc interested right but part of it the part of it that's getting clients is the family business being handed down to most people hmm. and then if it's first generation lawyers for example my experience when i moved back from new york i was getting a uh, I was qualified in New York as a lawyer. I moved back. Um I was getting 0.3% of my uh what I was making there. 
And but I was learning. When I went independent, my business model was I had one solicitor briefing me, and I used to also do um, consultancies for multilateral organizations and for international governments. Now the thing is, everyone has to have, especially if you're a first generation person, you have to have some kind of business model, right? But you know, coming back to uh, what you were saying about menstrual leave, I think it's incredibly important because. And the women's workforce participation rate. Um, now, my first degree is in economics, and uh, I've engaged somewhat with Rohini Pandey's work, who is a Harvard economist who's worked extensively on this stuff, right? Mm. On falling uh, labor workforce participation rate. You'd mentioned various bits of data. In 1995, it was 35 percent. Wow! So we're what going we backward. Doing? We're going backwards. We're going backwards. And frankly, when we speak of changing the status quo and taking down the patriarchy so that there is better constitutional equality on this, in this country, we are not speaking of activism. Let me be clear about that. What we are speaking about is building a platform so that everybody can participate. We are speaking of constitutionalism. We are speaking of rule of law. We are speaking of changing the status quo. Hmm. When we speak of the changes, changing the status quo, we cannot speak merely of women taking the onus of, oh, let's let's make sure that these discriminatory uh, workplaces don't hesitate in hiring us. Let us make sure that all the responsibilities that have been thrust on us alone, you know, mothers are valorized and rightly so. But would you ask any mother, would she rather be placed on, on a pedestal or would she rather have the village and the partner and the family show up yeah. on a regular basis. Absolutely. Would she rather have the childcare that is required to raise um, a child and have a mother that isn't overstressed and tired? And so, 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 is it? Are we, are we coming to? Are we coming to the conclusion that it's just the lack of cultural support and Indian women have too much on their plate? I want to get... Uh, uh, entirely. If I may just, just add yeah. something very briefly before you move on. Yeah. And root of a lot of this stuff is patriarchy, right? Because we've seen that development doesn't do it. Development doesn't automatically mean that you have more women in the workforce. Development doesn't mean the growth in GDP through mining companies, right? Doesn't mean that you have more... Uh, women contributing in real ways to the workforce. So in that sense, I think things like period leave, yes, but more significantly having an equality non-discrimination law, mm -hmm. saying that, look, we are going to take down the structures that are the barriers, that I think those are very important and attitudinal change, sure. making it happen. You know, but even so, the it would be difficult to argue that 30 years ago, the patriarchy was lesser than it is today. It wasn't. Exactly. So, exactly. Wasn't the point so why are we going backwards? One, one minute. Let me get Amisha in. Let me get Amisha in, and I'll of course come back to you. Let me get Amisha Vora in. And you know, uh, Amisha ji, I was very keen to talk to you because stock markets is something that you know everyone watches, everyone does. I think of all of you represented here today, I would say, and you know, I could be wrong statistically, it's uh, one of the most male-dominated sectors compared to anyone else on this panel uh, the uh, typical idea of someone in the market market participant is predominantly male i want you to start by telling us about your experience and are you seeing a change over the years of more and more women coming in i'm not talking about investors i'm talking about actual people on the floor in the brokerage firms uh, making those investment decisions so I would like to share a few things. So as what you say, the whole market is largely male dominated. And within that, I started my career as institutional sales head or institutional sales director. And I used to travel across the world. So typically it used to so happen that I would land in New York and the cycle would start. I don't think I ever really considered that you know, I didn't sleep the whole night and my meeting starts at eight and now this is the issue with the health. It never even struck me. But also, when we say that, you know, we should get more response from male and so on, I would touch upon that. But I used to be a staunch gen. 
so my clients used to rather organize a place where I can have a junk food in New York or Hong Kong or Singapore. Typically, this sales business is all over a dinner or a drink. I never used to drink and people used to still respect and work with me. So I think that there are a huge and huge table stroke excuses a on the part of ourselves we as women need to overcome number two i think the most real challenge that i found in my career that i never had a very reliable child care you know i used to depend on of course family but beyond that on to some or other slightly unorganized kind of a support and if we really focus on that urban women will be more than willing to join and i still feel that i don't know the basis of the statistics but most of them are self employed whether that gets really counted because there are a humongous number of small mid sized businesses which are sprawling which is done by women and i hope that numbers are taken by amisha ji in your organization are you how close are you to 50% women participation we are at 34% at the moment but one more very important story i'll tell you and which could be very encouraging one of my very talented she is a gold medalist mba she was with us in our institutional research she took a break for her child and it took her 7 years to bounce back or maybe 8 years to bounce back and she was very willing not to confine herself and today once again in 3 years she is the best sales person from my organization and one of the best on the street so i think that two things which come out is that we need to give chance back to people who want to bounce back particularly women and give them a little leeway in terms of really managing in case they want to manage their personal life or the child uh, initial years and also develop child care i think these two will go a very long way in getting or sustaining women you know uh, a, a very interesting announcement that has happened a few days ago was that a company called britannia is aiming to hire 50% of its staff as women by 2024 that's in about a year less than a year it's it's a mandate it's affirmative action but it's not because of a you know a csr or esg uh, situation the reason they've given is because in their field and for the requirement they find women to be more hygienic and uh, more disciplined and <laughs> which is why they want to hire women but what what struck me is what kind of a difference that can make if large companies start leading the way we have a goal of bringing the uh, women participation in the labor force up to 50% by 2047 i want to come to you first uh, visakha ji on this uh, companies have to take the lead and say that let me bring that number up to 50% in my own space in what i have in control Yeah, ab- absolutely. I think it's uh, definitely something that the companies will have to step up and do. The uh, there's one of the topics that I talk very often about, Tamanna, which is about differentiating between gender agnostic characteristics um, and gender neutral characteristics. You know, when people say, "Oh, we want someone who is very aggressive," don't automatically say male. if you say when if you know we want someone who is very detail oriented don't automatically think female you know try and distinguish characteristics which are distinct from that of men or women so i even talk about things like even if it's if it's hardcore running around in the sun and the rain because a sales person i said do you please don't make an assumption about the ability or the otherwise for the people to do it you know sometimes i have seen men completely from an endeavor to be uh, kind and gentlemanly you know totally bias themselves against hiring women it is so sad because their intention is really so so true and they just want to be nice people but i said in that 
in that whole nice person, you're being protectionist and you're robbing away opportunities from someone without even yeah. checking with that yeah. person. Yeah, I mean, keeping back someone's uh, opportunity to earn a bigger paycheck is not nice, frankly. However much you may dress it up as being a gentleman, <laughs> it's definitely... Absolutely. You know, we can be cynical about it. We can be positive about it. But the point also is that we have to admit that uh, there is a certain amount of God helps those who help themselves. We really need women to step up. We really need them to use all the opportunities that are available today. And we need to be able to um, get back that that passion to work, to have an identity of yourself and to not let uh, comfort cocoon you into not making an identity for yourself. But yes, I think it is as much an affirmative action by corporates hmm. who need to have that. You know, here, uh, I want to make it clear that it's at the end of the day a personal choice for any man or woman how they want to spend their time. If you don't have to work, um, you don't want to work, you, you can do whatever you want with your life uh, as long as you fulfill your obligations as a man or a woman. So that's this is about opportunity for those who want it. Yes. Uh, creating safe spaces for those who want it. Rutupan, I want to get your thoughts on what I think is going to be a game changer. A Britannia coming in saying that we will have 50% of our workforce as women. Look, this is exactly what I think I'm talking about. I'm talking about actually less legislation, but more role modeling, honestly. Uh, OECD suggests India is one of the most regulated countries, but well, one of the least protective of the interests that they are trying to protect. So the more of regulations is not the answer. We need role modeling like the way Britannia is paving the way. Uh, just to share with you some practical insights, you know, we have various organizations reaching out to us, especially to meet their diversity targets, right? We want to hire more women. For example, most of the e-commerce companies, uh, they have set themselves a target that they would like to have at least 25% of their vast workforce. And you know that workforce is largely male-dominated. When you talk here, when you think about a delivery agent, you don't think about a woman. When you think about a warehouse executive, you don't think of women, but they are all looking to hire. Uh, similarly, you know, like you said, yeah, Britannia is one. There are many manufacturing organizations who are actually wanting their shop floor to have a lot of women. But when it comes to actually mobilizing, yes, there are still on-ground challenge. For example, Britannia, most of their workforce are on, on, on sales side. You know, they are they are the ones who are merchandisers. They are actually um, in, with distributors and so on and so forth. So the question is that are we open for certain job roles? For Britannia to hit the 50% mark through their uh, stores, through their CNF agents, through their factories, they need to have women in some of the job roles, which are, by the way, today primarily male-dominated and male-preferred. So the question is how many women will put themselves out there to be able to make use of those opportunities. And I'm somebody who's a big believer. No one else is going to change my environment if I'm not going to change it for myself. I come from a very small town. I do not have fancy international background or degrees, to be honest, but I know how I had to slug it out to be able to achieve. I'm also a single mom, uh, but I've never, I, I have never figured, I had, it was a huge struggle, but I figured my way out that I'm going to hang in there and make sure that I, the opportunity that has been given to me doesn't go away. I'm not saying that I'm perfect, but I'm just saying that whatever opportunity comes our way, we should make, make use of it because that's how you're putting yourself in a position that can influence change for a lot of other women out there. And yeah. that happens my practitioner's approach to the situation. You know, uh, I think we, we've been talking about women leaning in. Uh, in just the last few years, I have seen women manning, uh, I think bad choice of words, but uh, women at <laughs> petrol pumps uh, dispensing fuel. I have seen uh, uh, Uber Ola driver who's uh, a woman. We now have uh, a paratrooper who's a woman. Uh, they are in the armed forces. So... Given an opportunity, uh, I don't think we'll find a lack of women who want to come forward. 
I, I don't know if it's the lack of opportunity that's holding women back or women not wanting to come in. Uh, Karuna, we were talking about Britannia's move uh, and the fact that they have stated as a goal that they want to add their workforce as 50%. And, you know, Rituparna's point is that in sort of um, top-down legislation, forcing companies to do things when a big player comes up and says this, that's the real game changer, isn't it? I very much appreciate and laud companies like Britannia who are doing this because it means that they raise the bar for other large companies. Um, the trouble is that the greatest employment in our country is actually in the informal sector. True. Right? In agriculture, it's in small um, household businesses and so I think the way we think about these things also needs to shift. You know, the women you have on this panel, I've been listening to everybody, they're all heroes in their own right. You know, I was quite moved by uh, what uh, uh, Ms. Chakravarti was saying about being from a small town, being a single mother, you know, and making it all work, like not letting that single opportunity go. Um, by, uh, you know, Amisha Ji, who was speaking about not being able to be one of the boys and go for drinks and, you know, being herself and eating the gen food and, you know, having those meetings and making it work in a different way. And, um, uh, you know, uh, Vishakha ji, who has risen to sort of uh, it was very serious heights in her profession and how she made the childcare work and the other stuff work, even though she had come from a public sector background. My point is simple, though, is that we shouldn't have to be heroes, right? Yeah. It shouldn't have to be this hard. Frankly, like, the kinds of structural barriers that, and, you know, I take, I take the point that, look, legislation is definitely not the answer to everything at all, you know? I think there are some things that there are economic nudges, there are policy nudges, there are things that now that many of us have a certain amount of power that we can do in our workplaces, in the legislation that we are a part of making, in the policies within workplaces that we are a part of making. For example, uh, uh, in some companies that I work with that have asked me to do, um, uh, you know, engage with them with their policies in terms of sexual harassment, some have said that, look, yes, it's a great idea. What we must do is make equality policies. So we, that we are dealing not just with sexual harassment, we are dealing with other issues in the workplace. We are dealing with things like, um, starting to deal with things like menstrual leave. We are starting to deal with things like um, discrimination. We are starting to deal with things like people, not just women, people who don't have a kind of out their affirmative style of leadership, have a quieter style of leadership, mm -hmm. making sure that women who do have an affirmative style of leadership don't get labeled aggressive, right? So there's a lot to be done. And while we must applaud and the women who make it happen, regardless of the thorns and to bear and the the delights of, you know, children and other, you know, family responsibilities that also can be extremely hard. Let's make it easier for everybody. Yeah. Let's bring the, the, the sort of wild and wonderful contributions that people of all genders have to bring to the workplace. You know, and I, I think, I think in, in, in a better country. Uh, Amisha ji, interesting point uh, to take off on is personalities in the workplace. There is this stereotype that to get to the top, to succeed, you have to be, as a woman, very aggressive, uh, very vocal, uh, uh, you know, superman, superwoman, hero, uh, unbelievable uh, tolerance levels for threshold pain, discomfort. You've talked about some of your own experiences. Uh, it shouldn't be, you shouldn't have to be penalized because you're a woman. The idea is to have the same opportunity. Absolutely. But I would still say that uh, it was not about, uh, you, you know, having a particular personality or anything. But it is actually about the focus. So when you focused on your work, some of the other things do not really matter to you. 
So you cannot really control everybody around you in terms of what opinion they are carrying, what judgments they are passing. Why I'm saying some of these things is that I think most of the time we have control our, over ourselves uh, while we keep on talking about policy making and other things. It's about how much attention do we want to pay to the judgments that we are people are passing, including women, on other, on other women, including uh, men, of course, on women. Those are some of the controllables which women needs to work on. Mm. And apart from, uh, I would rather like to say that I really appreciate Britannia's move because if a company of brand and repute commits to something, it also means that they will also work their way around if required training, if required coaching, if required counseling, and also making some of the other environment friendly for women to work. Yeah. yeah. Give them a little more friendly hours to work, little more flexibility in terms of working hours. I think their ability to contribute will increase much, much more because you can't restrict them till the time society really comes at par in terms of father and mother both being equally responsible for child. And that goes in the heads of father, but above that in the heads of mother, that mother will continue to hold 90% herself responsible for child, either performs or feels guilty. One of the two she keeps doing. Yeah. And because of which somewhere she will suffer. So you this know, is a I see that smiles around the panel with everyone who's felt mother's guilt <laughs> when you yeah, absolutely. want to outsource but can't let go. So I think a lot of people watching are, you know, resonating with your voice today. Vishakha, do you wanted to come in? Yes. I, I just wanted to say two small things, you know. One is I totally agree with uh, Karuna. I think we have been so often, uh, you know, glorified. And I use this phrase very often. I say this whole subjugation through glorification. And I think I think that's what has happened by glorifying the women to be caregivers, the glorifying the women for the multiple tasks they handle, by glorifying her for all that she does. I cringe every time I see one of those forwards which glorify all that a woman has done. And I'm like, hold on. I mean, why is why is this absolutely not subjugation? through glorification and I think that's what it is uh, we fall into that trap all of us I think something we need to very clearly work on I have a small difference of opinion on uh, legislature yes we can have policy nudges yes we can have economic nudges uh, but having been in the workplace now for 35 years non-stop uh, excepting for my maternity leaves for three months Let's say that we wouldn't have had maternity leave of six months if it had not been legislated. Yeah. India still has maternity leave. US doesn't even have maternity leave. And that couldn't have happened because we nudged people to do things of, you know, at the end of the day, sales needs to be incentivized. Sales can't be spoken to in soft, dulcet tones of why it's good for the organization. So some things have got to be hard coded. Some things which are needed have to be done. And um, I, I think time for a few legislative changes to be made. And having said which, having said which, I have also seen, unfortunately, women misusing these provisions. I've seen women joining, uh, you know, take their maternity leave, take full benefits, take their six months off, come back, work for 15 days and then quit. Mm -hmm. uh, I've equally seen those. And yeah, there needs to be there needs to be some yeah. some way. All, to all women cannot be heroes, and all women are not villains. They're just people yeah, like everyone beings. else. <laughs> they just they're human beings. Let's we be just that. want the same chances. Let's hope. Let's hope they can be more done because you know these numbers are concerning. Whether the uh, reasons are patriarchy, whether uh, the reasons are opportunity, to go backwards thirty years later. Uh, is something that needs very serious policy intervention, needs to be looked at. Are we looking at a post-pandemic effect? What are the other reasons? We need some serious research into it instead of just making grand statements. But I want to thank all of you.
for joining us today. I want to wish all of you a very happy Women's Day as well. And uh, thank you for your time and for sharing all of your stories. Thank you, thank you so much. And we also wish all the viewers very happy Women's Day.